having me this morning. It's nice to it's nice to see you. Um, I do feel a little bit like a fish out of water in some ways. I'll, I am not a tech expert at all, but I do understand and appreciate your faith in me, Dean Saxinian, that um, I could keynote an important tech inclusive conference. Um, for those of you who don't know me or don't know the kind of research that I do, I am a sociologist. I'm an inequality researcher primarily. And um, I, while I do not consider myself a diversity expert per se, I conceive of the many problems of inequality as problems of diversity. And there are certainly lots of implications for the work that I do um, in terms of various spheres of, 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 um, of diversity around uh, various sectors and institutions and organizations in our society. I, I want to talk to you today about why a work that comes out of a study that I've done across two nations, and I mostly my, my ideas, my conceptualizations, the empirical information I provide to you comes from research in schools as organizations. And as a previous speaker said, there is so much overlap between educational organizations and institutions and what happens in the private sector. Uh, but many of these things are dynamic, they're relational. They and our various social institutions is just, are just mere microcosms of what's happening in the greater society in some ways. So I want to talk to you why, about why diversity is not inclusion. And what I mean by that is while diversity is necessary, it is not sufficient to get to the kind of fundamental restructuring and change that, and transformation we want in our society. And I use this graphic, this really is a graphic for schools. It talks, this is a graphic that's often used to understand why diversity is about demographic change. And we have attempted to get to integrated schooling, or you can say integrated communities or organizations. And you can imagine little bodies can be any number of social identities. And you see the left side talks about diversity. But as you get into the organization and who's doing what, you see that the distribution actually varies significantly as you move from the bottom in this case, track and schooling to the top. And so the, the, the right side belies what, the, what the, the left side or the value or the principle that is supposed to be embedded in the left side. But don't let me jump ahead of myself. I'm just going to want to make some points today. I'm not going to be too long with you because I would like to engage with you. I, these are just some thoughts of mine in terms of conceptualization. So why we should even care about diversity and, and in, inclusion. I'm going to assume that I don't have to make an argument about that with this audience. But then I realized after hearing about what's going on in our society today with the national climate, the political ethos, that you can't always make assumptions. And, you know, I, I listened to a very expensive talk last night. And I, as I listened to that talk, I realized that, yeah, I cannot walk into a room and make assumptions anymore, even on this university's campus. And so I'm going to make five points about why I think we should care, because there is so much research that suggests why we should care. But a lot of, a lot of it is normative. So I stand before you, going to be fully um, reflexive, as we say in my field, methodologically about my standpoint and say that my normative values and beliefs are about the fact that every social institution, political and academic institution in society should reflect its people. That inclusion and diversity are fundamentally moral principles and values that we should hold if we subscribe to deal ideals of justice, of fairness, of equality. And those are values that I believe, and I would argue, and many philosophers and political scientists and other social scientists would argue, that are congruent with a democracy. So that's basic for me. But that's not actually what everybody believes, right? There are varying ideological belief systems in our country. And I'm going to suggest to you today that how we behave in our organizations fundamentally reveal what we actually believe. It's not what we say, because we say the socially desirable things often because of social stigma and shaming. But how we behave 
really fundamentally believe, really reveals what we believe. You act from a place of passion. You act from, you behave, you create practices and patterns from places where you fundamentally believe things are right or wrong. And the reality is ideology in our society is very much like a, a religion. If you believe things to be true, and for some of us that's more orthodox, and for others of us it's more liberal or progressive. And so how we believe on that spect spectrum, and I believe it was called a, a heat index of sort, or you can think about the indices or the gradations, the, that will, those, we will see some variation across the spectrum of the treatment of various populations or various groups within our organizations. But I do fundamentally believe that what we see is truly the miner's canary in some ways, or is the true signification of what we really fundamentally, our mindsets, what we believe. And there can be rigid mindsets, as some argue. There can be more moderate and mildly tolerant mindsets. There can be flexible mindsets. And so the spectrum of our tolerance, our beliefs, our values about diversity and inclusion varies significantly. We, we can also just care about diversity and inclusion. It doesn't have to be moral, but as the previous speaker said, there are some economic reasons, instrumental reasons why we should care. Research does show, right, that there can be actually increase to investments, profit returns. Um, I would argue even exposure. I'm looking at what's ha happening in Hollywood right now. There are so many sleepy, so many films that people slept on because of the targeted demographic group that have just gone on to do extraordinarily well. And this past summer, for example, in the in, in the media uh, world, there were just there was just there were a number of flops because we hadn't thought about the demographic groups and the targeting and the marketing and who's directing and who is creating stories and all of those kinds of things. So diversity is starting to appear even in instrumental ways. And depending on those who are the gatekeepers, those who make the decisions, who are in the power positions, depending on what their stance or their mindsets or their values are gonna be, they will either open the door and increase the potential even more for profit or they won't. But that's a mindset, that's an ideology. It's also, it's also about comfort. There is a social psychological, there are arguments about social psychologically about why we do things the way we do. But so there are legal reasons we are often made to do things, we're compelled to do things by law. In this country, we've changed over the last hundred or so years about who should be included. Now the question is whether or not those laws have actually gotten us far enough, and I think as I show you the day, some of the data in the moment, is that we have not gotten sufficiently ahead. Just because there are laws on the book does not mean that it's deeply coupled with what happens on the ground. And that is one of the fundamental challenges that we see in education, a decoupling from actual practice from the macro level structures that the laws say or the policies say. Because once again, those policies have to be practiced by individuals. So here's the macro to the micro policy uh, uh, problem, I say, as a sociologist. Individuals as gatekeepers can determine the degree and the depth to which that principle or that di directive is actually implemented. And that is possibly one of the things that we're seeing a lot in the tech world. And I don't want to stand here and tell you about the tech world because I'm not a tech expert. I'm going to tell you what I see in terms of the numbers around diversity in various social spheres. And, and finally, another domain I want you to consider about why diversity should matter, even in the tech world. It's because where we spend the majority of our time today, from children to adults, are in schools and in the workplace. Those relationships can become some of our most intense and some of our most intimate. Those relationships constitute our social networks where information is constantly tra traveling across strong and weaker ties because often someone knows someone who knows someone who can tell you something else or can get you somewhere or who may have an, a new uh, idea or who may have know something for your child. Those networks matter, and those networks also oftentimes determine with whom we're comfortable, whom we're going to invite into our families as our partners or as our spouses, whom, the, the persons with whom we want to choose to live in our neighborhoods, 
And segregation today, economic and social segregation, I will suggest to you, based on my research and many others, is one of the fundamentally banes, one of the fundamental banes of American society right now. There is so much inequality in our society that is promulgated by social segregation and that also resides in our workplace. And the reason why diversity and inclusion in our workplace can matter is because it can help us to begin to chip away at a really deep, hard, rigid structure that foments the kind of social, economic, and political division we have today. We don't know how to do difference very well in American society. We don't know how to talk across difference because we live in homogenized communities for the most part, almost all of us. And that is a problem. It's a fundamental problem. We don't know how to talk about people who are politically different with people who are politically different, who are religiously different, who are socially and culturally different. We hear the words in the public sphere. We don't know how to practice it very deeply in our personal and private lives. And we could if we had more exposure to one another. That's why it matters in terms of having it. That's another civic and social reason fundamentally for the health of this democracy, why we need to widen and broaden the systems, the organizations in terms of diversity and inclusion. So I'm gonna talk about just five things today about what we know about diversity in and through the lens that this is off, this is empirically grounded, I would like to argue and suggest to you, I don't, I'm not just gonna talk, I'm not talking rhetoric, I'm talking about ideas that I've culled from research. The first one, <laughs> is about how the problems of inequality of opportunity are problems of diversity. Let me first differentiate. I wrote a report where my colleague Sean Reardon down at Stanford, we call, call Inequality Matters, which was actually um, published by the William T. Grant Foundation. We need to make a distinction between inequality as the distribution of individual attributes. We're not all born with the same constellation of attributes. So indeed, there are certain forms of inequality that are just normal. You know, I really wish I were Serena Williams. <laughs> like, I love tennis, but I can't play like that. I've tried since I was a child, right? I just wasn't born with that. You know, with that ability, that innate ability to play tennis like that. Or sing like, wow, oh my gosh, Billie Holiday, or Lisa Fisher, who's one of my favorite singers, or Nina Simone. I can't, so we all are not born with the same kinds of attributes. And many people reside, fall back on the differences in individuals' attributes as something that we just can't solve. Yeah, we're all different. We have different casts, we're born in different contexts, we have different skills, we have different attributes, but that's not what most of us inequality researchers are talking about. We're talking about inequality in terms of opportunity and access to opportunity. An inequality that is patterned by groupness, not individuals, but groupness. So that you have pattern outcomes so that it's, it seems that it, where it is actually true that it is not random. It's, 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 it's non-normal where you see racial and ethnic and gender patterns, where you see class patterns within a particular social organization. If that were random or normal, what's implicit under that, I would suggest to you today, is that we would have to subscribe to arguments about the pure intellectual inferiority and superiority of particular groups. Those kinds of inequalities, those kinds of patterns signify something about structures, mechanisms, history, culture, and the confluence of those things. And if we're willing to deny those things, the confluence of a host of factors that shape the kind of pattern outcomes that we have, then we have to fall back on what this former Google employee believes that there are fundamental biological differences between or among groups. And I don't buy that. The research doesn't show it. And so some research, certain kinds of research, I'll put it in quotes, may show it, but I, I, I won't. Or if you don't fall into a biological argument, you're most likely 
to explain these patterned grouped outcomes of inclusion and out exclusion, more likely to believe some kind of cultural deficit, subscribe to a cultural deficit or cultural depravity model, which also does not hold up in the national representative data samples as we look. So let's take on this first one right here, because I think this is really fascinating to me. This is how I knew that inequality. I'm going to go to this. I wanted to bring this up. I don't know how many of you saw this New York Times article that came out a few years, a uh, few, last year was it? The leaders of the Americas, like every sector in American society and who the leaders are, this is what I mean. They reviewed 503 of the most powerful people in American culture, government, education, and business. They found just 44 people of color or minorities. And not just underrepresented, that's all categories of minority. And then there were even, and certainly there weren't 50% who were women. Look, here are the leaders of the largest American, now this has changed a little bit, right, because this just came, this came out last year, of the largest American corporations. You can just look up the faces, check out the gender identities, right? That's, that's the corporations. The ones in yellow are your minorities and women. Out of five, out of, that's American corporations, power. This is under the Obama administration, so we definitely owe. Here is the president, his council, and his cabinet. It certainly doesn't look like that today. Here are the presidents of the most elite or esteemed universities, or some of them. That was a little bit more balanced in terms of gender, certainly not race and ethnicity. Here are the US senators. Just look. These are the power sectors of our society. Is this normally distributed? Is it random? Hmm. Here are the Hollywood executives who choose which movies are made. This is the power structure of American society. The people who choose what music we listen to or gets produced. Now people are circumnavigating. Look at the mayors of America's largest cities. People who wield the most influence over which books we read. Now you see a little bit of gender diversity in some of these sectors, not all of them. Here are the people who decide which television shows we see. The one on the bottom right, she's bad. She's just moving on up in the ranks. But look at what she's dealing with. Look at that industry. I wish I could be her too. People who decide what news gets covered in our society. Look at the news. Who controls the news cycles? United States Supreme Court justices. It's yeah, that's funny. American governors. This, this has changed slightly since their election, so I apologize for the datedness, but this, you get the point. America's top military advisors. Can you imagine, I often wonder, if there were women who were running our military institutions, so what would the world look, how, would, how different would it look? I sometimes think about that, not just centralized, but I wonder, it's an empirical question. Um, here are the people, because uh, baseball is American, right? The owners of professional base, ba oh, this is basketball teams, wow. So basketball teams. Owners of pro football teams, I don't see any women, but I do see one or two persons of color, Owners of the baseball teams, all men, no people of color. So those are the ba ma major sectors. That's where power. Now, if you think that that, or believe that that's random, then I have some really, 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 really strong views about perhaps your cognitive um, <laughs> thinking. But I. I <laughs> I might get in trouble for saying that, so let me shut up. <laughs> uh, I just, I, 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 that's not random. That's a lot about, that, that says a lot about history, that says a lot about power, that says a lot about our um, constitution of our society. This is why diversity matters. The people who affect our daily lives in every sphere are predominantly of one particular, well, we all have multiple social identities, but they're predominantly of one gender and predominantly of one race. That is not reflective of American society. That is supposed to be a free 
a just and an equal United States of America. The problems of diversity, the second point, is that the problems of diversity tend to be highly salient in contexts and organizations with high status, power, and significant resources. I've just shown you the picture at the American level. Let's move to the tech world, because that's what this conference is about. It's very interesting. I, I did my, my research, because that's the first thing I do <laughs> when I have to give a talk, to think about what is what. And you may have seen these data already over the last two days. The areas in which tech workers, 1,800 tech workers were surveyed, feel that their companies need to improve. What was stunning to me is that more than 50% in many categories do not believe that there needs to be improvement. We're talking about mindsets and beliefs now and how they drive change. For gender, there is a belief that there needs to be some improvement and some big improvements, a little bit more for, for gender, um, not too significantly different from age and race. But for the most part, there are many people in these industries, in these companies, who do not believe that there needs to be very much improvement, at least 50%. So the first question is, how do you get to those people? What do you, how, do you, how do you affect change on that kind of thinking? If you can, understanding that ideolog ideology can be rigid. It's a belief system. How do you change that? Understanding that even if you put all kinds of data in front of people, if it works like religion and you fundamentally, fundamentally believe that that is what it is, like climate change, you don't believe it, despite all of the research that's been put out there by some of the most renowned thinkers and doers in the world, then that's what goes. Now, I'm not going to try to be hopeless here. I'm going to try to build towards a, a cause, a, 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 a moment of, of hopefulness. But there, this is what many people in the tech organizations believe. Here, you've seen this, and I'm not going to go. I, I, I've been, I'm talking about race and ethnicity today. A previous speaker talked about gender. But I'm, I want you to see also the tech industry in relationship to other industries out there. And this is from Morgan Stanley, I found a graph. The, the um, technology, my arrow is in the wrong place, pardon that, is not on telecom. It should be forwarding, pointing to the one to the right. But you'll see that the blue is the percentage of women employees, the green is the percentage of women executives, the orange is the percentage of women managers, and the gold is the percentage of women on boards. Where there is the most representation is in the financial um, industry for women. But as you move up the ladder in terms of inclusion in the decision making, in terms of the power positions, and specifically on technology right here, you see that in every industry it gets lower and lower in terms of representation. And technology is about fifth um, from the top when it comes to these other industries are doing slightly better in terms of the incorporation of women. How does Silicon Valley compare to other tech hubs? I pull these data from a sociologist named Maya Beasley, who's at the University of Connecticut, who's written a lot of really interesting, she's uh, actually done a quite a bit of interesting work for the Center for American Progress. She blogs, she's written books about um, individuals in elite uh, corporate settings, particularly people of color. This is by race. If you'll see how Silicon Valley, she's written this, I took these data in terms of other major metropolitan areas where the tech industry exists. You'll see how black tech workers are represented and, and Hispanic tech workers compare, uh, compared across the various uh, cities in this country. The Washington DC area is doing the best, of course. Um, and, and that's not a course, but given the demographics of that, it's still underrepresented, but it's significantly higher than Silicon Valley where there's only 2.2% of the workers are black and about 4.7%. That's significantly, significantly underrepresented in our country. Um, and that's where we are. The second thing, the third thing that I want to say, so that point there was about how diversity is often a problem in high status contexts where power and resources and status matter. And you saw how that affects, in how that looks in terms of gender, how that looks in terms of race and ethnicity. And we can also see, bring that to the university context, particularly elite university context. There's a lot of competition 
And there's a lot of competition for one of the spaces in the most elite, the most profit generating, the most high status spheres. And in that is there is likely, I would suggest and hypothesize, the tendency to want to hold on to more rigid beliefs or mindsets, even if you consider yourself liberal or progressive, because the idea is how to be competitive with another at the individual level. Self-interest oftentimes undermine the prof project of getting group pros pro pros uh, progress at the group level for historically disadvantaged groups. Self-interest, my desire to be high status, to be competitive, to get mine, often undermines and our practices and, belief and behaviors can collude in the processes of inequality and in the processes of inhibiting any kind of progress for other groups that have been historically denied. That is a major paradox in American society today. It's a paradox in education, it's a paradox in the tech industry, it's a paradox in every other sector of power in our society. And as, though, diversity attempts increase, and as we open the doors to bring in more people, often senses of group threat, privilege, and entitlement increase too. This is what the social psychological literature is showing us. This is why we are here today. As we've opened up American society, I want to suggest to you, as we open up our organizations, we start to actually see what the gradations of inclusion really are. There will be many who will argue, no, I don't believe in discrimination. No, I don't subscribe to inequality. Yes, I believe all people are equal. But then if it gets too far to pass a particular tipping point, the research is showing us that other kinds of behaviors will come out to belie or reveal, more reveal just how deeply those beliefs or mindsets go. And so here is one we, we can look at what's happening at the nation. This is something we all know, is that the threat of minority majority America changes racial attitudes in our country. There is probably parallel research when it comes to gender. Herbert Bloomer, who was a sociologist, a very prominent one in 1958, wrote a seminal argument about race as, as, and prejudice as a sense of group position. It's not just about individuals' beliefs, it's about the threats that one feels about one's group. Consequently, we have a heightened awareness in this society today as the doors of opportunity have opened since 1965, even through 2016 or so, as it has opened for African Americans, Latinx, Native Americans, women, um, LGBTQ people, um, for various other groups, for the disabled, however many groups of inclusion you want to think about, as it is open, we're now at a point where there is some pushback. You've gone too far. And the question you will have to think about even within organizations is what's too far? What's the tipping point? In my area of research, when it comes to education, when it comes to integration of communities and schools, the tipping point is so low for whites that a school would tip if a school goes too far past 5 to 10% black. That's problematic. That's about a mindset. That's about a belief. And so that's what the research shows. I'm not just spewing numbers or saying things. We see now that in this particular, this is from the Association for, of, for Psychological Science, that when white participants were rate, asked to rate blacks, Latinos, and Asian Americans on, um, on, on different outcomes, on different beliefs about them, when they talked about the increases in the, in, in the, the numbers or the shifts in different demographics, the perspectives about those groups started to diminish. The beliefs of the goodness, the positive beliefs started to diminish. And so we're in a moment, I would suggest to you, where we may have gotten some racial fatigue. And no one's writing about it, because how do you really prove it other than to look at attitudes? But the miners' canary is also reflected in who's represented in our sectors of power, in our organizations. 
and in America's high, in higher education, actually, over the last 40 years, the top 35 colleges and universities have remained stagnant in the proportion of students who are black and Latinx who are in their schools. Stagnant. This was in the New York Times just two weeks ago. If you look at the data in corporations, when, in terms of gender inclusion or racial and ethnic inclusion, it's gotten a little bit better because going from zero to one is a 100% increase, right? <laughs> but the question is, where might it top off? If we don't attend to the social psychological as well, the sense of group threat, but it's not even the sense of group, it's in addition to the sense of group threat, it is also about the belief that I am entitled, that this is mine, and that I can't share the pie. And that's at an individual level, and, and this is a conundrum that I think we're in in a society. The fourth point that I want to make is that while I said diversity is necessary, and I believe it is, you can't, as, as the previous speaker said, you really can't get to inclusion if you don't get the bodies through the door. It's not sufficient. I've made this argument, I showed this was the opening graphic, I come back to it. But I also, I'm coming back to it not just to show it to you, but what happens even once we get groups through the door matters. In my field, the argument among some practitioners and policy makers now is that integration doesn't work. Inclusion doesn't necessarily work. Look at the outcomes of those students who were historically denied opportunity who have been in those schools. They don't do as well as their white peers. So I decided to, uh, to investigate why. And when I go behind the, the walls, of the organization, I found all kinds of things that indicated to me why students were. There is actually segregation within so-called diverse environments. The segregation can happen in terms of your social position, your location within the organization. What roles or tasks are you doing that are differential from what roles and tasks those who have been historically privileged in that setting doing? Often they're differential. The experience can also be different in terms of the expectations about your ability. How those who are the gatekeepers, those who are the trainers, the managers, the leaders, the actual attitudes and mindsets they bring about particular groups and their ability to do. Stereotypes permeate, pervade. There's also agency. I don't deny, you know, those on the, on the right often say, well, personal responsibility, individuality, individual expression. It is true, as the social psychological research suggests, that individuals will tend to move towards affinity groups, even within the workplace, for comfort, for a sense of belonging. And sometimes that means that you may not even choose to engage or partake, or ex or partake in or accept a particular role because you don't want to be divided from those who make you feel comfortable or give you a sense of belonging. There are so few of you. And this is what happens in schools. And so we find that children who come from historically disadvantaged groups tend to want to self-congregate or self-segregate segregate into specific roles or tasks for comfort, for a sense of belonging. But paradoxically, when I go into high-performing majority-minority schools, those students are spread across the spectrum in terms of the class participation, extracurricular activities and engagement, roles and performances they take. So it's not just like it's something innate to the group. It's about the context. That's what the research shows. So in order to be inclusive in organizations, we have to be mindful of the dynamics that pervade and we have to think about it as at a macro level in terms of what the, the gatekeepers are doing. We have to think about it at a meso level in terms of the social networks and where people place themselves and how they engage one another across various boundaries. We have to think about it at the micro level in terms of individuals and their sense of being and efficacy and their sense of belonging. And so inclusion entails a host of a, a set of different dynamics that we have to be attended to, and there are things that we can actually manipulate and control within our organizations. But first, we've got to get the bodies in there. Now, in terms, and I'm not going to say too much about this, 
But in terms of how we work in diverse environments, is that one of the things that I found in my research is that I ideology about how to be inclusive values. Many times inclusion cannot occur even when you get to the diversity part because some perspectives that prevail are social blindness. Well, for example, color blindness, or you can be gender. You know, it's like, you're, I'm going to ignore the structures of inequality. I'm not going to see color. I'm not going to see your gender. I'm not going to see your social, sexual orientation. Those things we're not going to talk about. We're just all human here. Well, that's a problematic perspective, according to some of the sociological research. Because one, it fundamentally ignores structures of inequality. You do need to see gender if you want to make sure that women are woven or braided throughout the organization. You need to be attendant to gender. You need to do the same thing for race and ethnicity. Otherwise, you can reproduce privilege and advantage in that setting. The other thing is to, 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 to reproduce this idea of equal treatment. We're all the same, so we're going to have the same practices for everyone. I was in a school that decided we were going to have the same practices for everyone. Even though they were trying to incorporate historically disadvantaged kids, they did not attend to cultural differences. They did not attend to the timing of when parent-teacher meetings were. You can imagine what that might look like in your, your organizations. I can imagine that if people are different culturally, religiously, or certain times of the day, if you don't make certain kinds of exceptions or, or uh, be flexible in some ways, you're actually signifying some forms of inclusion here. You can reproduce the dominant social group's way of being as the normal or the regular. So that's another mode in which we can be exclusive. If you don't acknowledge differences and the core practices remained unchanged, you're not being inclusive. And in our schools, even though they were diversifying and they had the bodies there, they had many of them. In my study, hadn't actually fundamentally changed some of their core practices. John Powell, who's a legal scholar here, has argued, he said, if you want to get to true integration, and by extension, I talk about inclusion, he says that you have to accept and think about the fact that diversity is about demographic change, but true integration is about fundamental organizational change. It is about how are you moving the groups who have historically been on the margin to the center. And you have to be vigilant about practice, which means that you have to think about radically inclusive ways of doing things. You attend to the threats of inequality, by attending to look, by, by, main, by maintaining some, 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 some vigilance about where are the boundaries in our organization? How are we maintaining boundaries among groups across race and gender? Practicing ways for myriad groups to feel as if they belong in that, in that organization. Taking those culture and climate surveys and say, making space for those who's silent, even trying to think about who's silent and who's invisible here, who's not seen, that thing, those things are very important. My last and final point to you. Another diversity talk or workshop will not solve the problem without substantial organizational change. This is not going to do anything. I appreciate being here this morning. <laughs> but the research is showing it too. And I'm going to direct your attention if you haven't already seen this. Frank Dobbins, my former colleague at Harvard University in the Department of Sociology, and uh, Alexandra Kalev is his, 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 his uh, colleague. She's, at, she's, a universe, she's a professor at the university, at Tel Aviv University. And Frank has been doing this research for many years. And it's very fascinating what they found with this issue. And this issue was particularly on it, if you haven't, I would direct your attention. They found that while many, and you know, many, many organizations, the diversity issue, the diversity problem, diversity problem, many tech organizations, many organizations are expending tons of resources bringing in speakers and consultants and having workshops, and we do this in education for professional development. That is a start. But the research is showing that the long-term impact is pretty anemic. And it's pretty anemic because if you have people sit and listen for a few hours in a day, that's not, it, it took us centuries to get here. We can't undo it in a day or two or a week. This is a long-term investment. And so what they found is that while most people who were partaking in these diversity programs and workshops learned to provide politically correct responses to questions about bias, in the long term, they forgot the answers 
particularly if you weren't practicing it in your day-to-day -day life. And the reports increased, um, and they found increased animosity toward other groups following these trainings. Racial fatigue, gender fatigue. Dobbing and Kalev also found that five years after establishing mandatory diversity trainings for managers, the proportion of white men, white women, black men, and Latinos in management positions remained stagnant, while the proportion of black women and Asian Americans decreased. It's just not enough. The, organ, the change has to happen through every sphere of the organization. It can't, and I'm starting to call this symbolic multiculturalism, symbolic diversity training. The actual, the real, is in the day-to-day -day work. It's in the day-to-day -day constitution of the organization. So I've talked to you about these five things that we know about diversity. I'm gonna to try to end with some hope. Here's some questions that you could ask of your organizations. These are adapted from my own book about what I ask schools to think about. Is that what organizational patterns or practices or contexts that engender an inequitable pattern by social groupings or identity, what are the patterns? First, determine what they are. How do you see people in the organization categorized, grouped, in terms of positions, roles, a location, status, privilege, disadvantage? When should cultural identities matter and when should they not matter and when it comes to specific organizational practices? It's important to interrogate that. We can't just be social blind, socially blind, or gender blind, or color blind. Like there are moments when the, when the identities have to actually matter if we want to get better. Are there either advantages or disadvantages to having this practice only affect a certain subgroup or subgroups in the organization? And can this particular practice be deemed egalitarian? Can it be deemed balanced or imbalanced? Can it be deemed disfavoring or favoring some and not others? These are four fundamental questions that I ask of schools as, as, as social and cultural organizations, as, as, as organizations that are trying to include all. And then here are some recommendations that I would suggest for organizational leaders and managers. Be aware that your own social and cultural knowledge base is limited. I don't know everything, most of us don't know everything, particularly when it comes to the inclusion of others who are different from us. It is important to, to, be in, in, to engage and to be in dialogue and to work alongside others who know more about these issues than we do. I think it's, I fundamentally believe it's important also, and this is something that I also heard in that half million dollar speech last night, is that I do think that um, it's really important for us to think about how past and present social dynamics inform how, we, how we've gotten to this era of exclusion. We, pre, we often preclude um, thinking about history because we say the bygones, let bygones be bygones, that was a past era. But a lot of why we are in the moments we are, a lot of reasons why we are where we are today has to do with the accumulated system of disadvantage. And so you need to understand where the genesis of the problem started. And, and what are some of the things that have happened institutionally that would preclude or prevent or inhibit, for example, women from going into STEM fields? It's, it's, a, it's a paradox today that there's a higher percentage, particularly in many of our college and universities, there's a higher percentage of young women than there are men, but disproportionately lower percentage of women than men in various fields. It's also a paradox, and in some of the tech world, I understand you don't actually need to go to college. There, there's recruitment right out of high school, right? So then we actually need to go before, before higher ed and even think what's happening in K-12 and where our students are allocated or where they are. We also have to think about history in terms of how our schools are even structured and the opportunity structures that are within various neighborhoods and communities and accumulated disadvantage. And it's important to think if we really want to include how we as institutions, as organizations can invest in different practices that could even help cultivate the, our own pipeline. How can we grow our own? How can we do, how can we, how can we invest in programs, deep programs, not just superficial ones, 
that if um, programs that will bring the kinds of people from the various backgrounds that we want into the fold? That's a big question. The other thing is, I, I, I firmly believe Maya Beasley has also shown in some of her work that we're underutilizing people who actually do have the degrees in these areas. If you want more colleagues from sp specific groups, you can actually hire them. There's actually underemployment in certain sectors. So they're there. They're just not being hired. And I've said, made the same point at the end. So be vigilant. And I thank you. Sure. Take advantage of this great opportunity. I'm happy. Yes, who, where? This one? There. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, oh, thank you. Um, thanks for the enlightening talk and especially the distinction between diversity and inclusion. I'm curious to know whether or not there is empirical evidence of organizations that have shifted in their organizational structure to become more inclusive um, and whether or not that has affected persistent change. Uh, positive and persistent change? <clears throat> That's a good, it's a very good question. I am not aware of longitudinal studies of organizations. Uh, well, it depends on what kinds of organizations you're talking about. First of all, in order to do that, you'd have to set up or design a longitudinal study that will set, uh, examine an organization over years. And I'm not aware, and it may depend on the field. I focus mostly on schools. There are, we have national data that allows us to look at certain indicators at a district level or a school level, but not at classroom levels where, uh, which, impact, which impact students, but we could look over decades, over years with cohorts. Um, but I'm not, that's a, bit, that's a great question for a business school um, researcher. Um, you, someone else here may know, but it, it, this re would require a longitudinal study of an organization. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, I can hear you. Some believe that conversations about inclusion, diversity, and equity are simply symptoms of a bigger issue, the issue of recent social demands for redistribution of power, control, and wealth. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about this? Should conversations about power, control, and wealth be interjected into the discussion of inclusion, diversity, and equity? So. Well, I thank you for that. I, I, I maybe I didn't connect the dots very well, but I, that's why I started and began the way I did. It is a conversation about the distribution of power, resources, and and and, and wealth. And if in this country, particularly if we want to think about the productivity in the next 30 or 40 years of all of our people and who are going to populate heavily our schools and things like that, it's really important for us to have the inputs and the investments um, in those particular communities. But otherwise, unless we want to go to an apartheid system, and that's the inherent danger in this country. So the major sectors in our country, the major sectors of power in our country, as you saw from the New York Times, um, photographs um, show that we don't have a country that's reflective in terms of shared resources and power, even wealth. We don't have a country that reflects the demographics of this country. So I start with that as a problem. The problem of inequality in terms of shared resources is a problem of diversity. That's why diversity matters. All right. One more? Yes. Uh, I have a question. You had mentioned, uh, obviously, self-interest self-interest becomes an issue as we move forward towards diversity. Mm -hmm. Have you seen, it, it's just a real human problem. Yeah. Um, have you seen anything that actually worked? Because it, that's what people feel in the privileged group is that they have to give up something for somebody else. There's only a few number of slots. And I think that's one of the hardest things to kind of appeal to. You probably see it so much more in education um, with parents wanting their kids to go quote unquote best schools. Have you seen anything to kind of help help that and get over the, the self-interest piece and the zero-sum thinking? Well, the, 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 difference, the, the difference comes at a, na a comparative national level. If you look at other liberal democracies around the world that have 
a different kind of national culture and ethos than ours, then you start to get in bigger questions. And this is comparative economics, comparative politics, comparative culture, cultural analysis by nation states. When you walk into, from the research and from the reading that I've done, even our neighbor to the north, Canada, which is a very, very diverse society, has a very different um, approach and orientation towards the inclusion of its diverse people, even though they still struggle significantly with their First Nations population. But they are one of the highest performing countries in the world. Uh, one is because of the, the way resources are distributed around to make sure that there's just a solid basis in terms of the well-being for many of their citizens and residents. Um, when you go to northern European countries, which are not as diverse as our social, uh, uh, socially, racially, and ethnically, but they're increasingly so dealing, doing, dealing with demogra uh, demographic change through immigration, those countries have a commitment to making sure that there is a solid foundation um, and just basic standard of living for all of its people that's different than ours. So part of it is what we're socialized into in American society. We're fundamentally an individualistic nation. And that's a conundrum. That's the conundrum. Yeah. All right. With that, I think we'll have to wrap up. Thank you so much for joining us today.